Yeah, well, Dean, you're looking very relaxed. I kept thinking people should lie down up here and <laughs> come into my chamber. But anyway, um, let me just dangerous. start out. Uh, we have, you guys are all representatives of industry, various components of industry, yet you're all different. We had Ed Zhao up there, and we had uh, Peter Fadelnik, who's uh, from the European Union. Do you look at, at, at Congressman Chow and, and the Europeans as friends or foes? Dean? Friends. Really? Yes, really. I think these are, in fact, the issues that we're talking about are some of the most significant economical, societal issues uh, of the day. And we all have an important role to play in figuring out the solutions. And so it's a broad ecosystem, and all of the critical players in the ecosystem uh, need to figure out some of the solutions. And so Europe, I think, has been quite brave in taking a first step in figuring it out. I don't suspect that it will be the last step. And so I don't view them as a foe at all. Victoria, Michael? So I, I, think, I think the GDPR was a really important step forward. And I think there is, and hopefully we'll have a chance to talk about that. I think important there, like in a happy way? Important like in an important way. So yes, we're supportive <laughs> of GDPR. Um, we think GDPR is a good thing. We are, you know, our companies are very protective of privacy. They've been out at the forefront of that. You know, I, I know that we're probably going to talk about the situation here in the U.S., but I think one of the things that I'd love to talk about is the fact that this conversation about privacy, this important conversation about privacy, is happening in a lot of countries around mm -hmm. the world. So we're, you know, we are talking to governments in Japan and South Korea and India and Brazil. And where hopefully all of this will move us to eventually is a harmonized system around the world. Mm. So what's happening in the United States is really important, and I want us right. to have a chance to talk about that, and I assume right. that we will. But long term, really where we need to get to is a harmonized consensus worldwide. Michael? Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, you know, we, here in the United States, we do need a unified approach to privacy. There we go, microphone. Um, to show that we are leaders. We've been leaders in tech and innovation, and this is another area where we should be leaders. Um, I don't think we should just import wholesale what they've done in Europe, though all of our companies are complying with it and it's working. Um, but we're pushing now for a national um, standard, national solution. So, Victoria, you opened the box on what's going on in the world. So let me ask you, in Brazil, in India, in China, which has come up a lot today, is there any country out there that you think that gets the social equities and the corporate dimensions of this right, gets that equilibrium right? So I think... So like way better than the United States. So who's, who's no, I wouldn't say better than the United States. I think there are a lot of, there are many governments are trying to be really thoughtful about this. I will say, I think Japan is a really interesting model and perhaps particularly interesting because they recently uh, got something called adequacy from the European Union, which is a horrible term uh, in my opinion, um, but essentially means that Europe agrees that they have a very strong privacy system that is certainly not identical to GDPR mm. and I think actually has some helpful flexibility, but is consistent with really strong privacy protections. And I think... Um, you know, I think I just think Japan has is a is among the countries that has been really thoughtful about this. I think there's some other countries where we have more concerns about where where the privacy discussion is taking them. Um, but I think I think Japan is a really important. And there's actually really interesting things happening in APEC countries, in Asia Pacific countries across the board. Yeah. Thank you. Dean, you, uh, I also know you've been around the world, but I wanted you to weave it in as something that Senator Warner talked about today, which is you know, he, he sort of tried to flesh out what a social contract could look like between the tech world, particularly the social media side. But I know that you cover, you know, virtually every player, not just social media platforms of the Internet, but but hardware and so on. But how do you get that world kind of in greater sync with public interest at this time? And he was pretty critical um, of the view that there had not been a culture of public interest in in these firms and that they didn't they were derelict in their social contract responsibilities so how do you i mean you cover so much about how would you frame that discussion and how do you tweak the various players into a greater compact of a mutual empathy if you will i i think that this is a i think the construct of a social construct is is a useful one because i think one of the things that europe hasn't gotten perfectly right is consideration of all of the key players in the ecosystem. Um, and I think California failed at that as well because the California bill didn't allow for the sort of public discourse and discussion that's necessary to get the construct right and to balance all of the equities that are at play. Um, I, I think Senator Warner is right that that 
process has to occur here in the United States. I think the thing that he underestimates is the extent to which at least the companies that I represent are engaging in that thoughtful discussion and deliberation both here and internationally. And the unique posture and position that we have in seeing what is workable. Uh, I think there's the sense that because there are companies that they are not considering these issues and endeavoring to find um, balance in all of the equities that are at play, and, and they very much are. Can I jump in on that too? I mean, I, I disagree with the, the premise or the idea that, at least for internet companies, that they're not in sync with society or individuals. You'd be hard pressed to find another industry that's able to change as quickly as, as our companies do or as, or as in tune with individual users. I mean, if people aren't happy with privacy settings, they always add new tools and these con companies are constantly evolving to meet the needs and expectations of their users. And that doesn't really happen anywhere else. You know, you think about, you know, airlines and they just keep making the seats smaller no matter what people say, or I mean, you know, any other industry. Um, and also as it relates to data, uh, it makes people's experience online better and their lives better, particularly, and it's a lot more transparent with our companies than it is with, you know, everybody's been talking about Equifax. You know, if you're not happy with name the app or website they're using, you can stop using it if you want. Um, and you can delete your data and all these things. Um, but there's so many other actors out there in the ecosystem that you're just not even aware of. And you can't cancel your account. You can't say, I don't want to be your customer anymore because that's just not an option. Yeah, I think th I think the other thing that Senator Warner underestimates or doesn't give enough sense to in this conversation is just how complex these issues are. And so if you think about the most significant economic issues over the last 300 years, you know, whether you're talking about land or machines, we've developed rules and regulations for dealing with them because they're essentially zero sum goods. You know, you have the land or you don't. In the context of data, we have to, it's all very new. Uh, we've not developed rules before, and so we have to work together to, to figure it out. And uh, his suggestion that it is so simple is simply inconsistent with reality. So, so in his, you know, uh, the Warner 20 point plan, but he comes down to sort of three principles. Uh, I know that, that, that the Internet Alliance and, and, and Software Alliance uh, or Internet Association have put out uh, parts of what they would like to see as, as a step forward. And I think this morning, Senator Warner outlined, you know, people having some knowledge of what their data was being used for. Are, are you in disagreement with those? Do you find those sort of part of the simplistic Warner No, I wasn't suggesting points? that the principles for moving us forward is simplistic. I was suggesting the idea that, that we can find solutions immediately or that we are doing something that's inconsistent uh, with reality is oversimplifying the dynamic. Um, I think we have an important role to play in that we have a unique perspective uh, in part because of what Michael said and the, the connection and the role that we play, uh, the connection we have to consumers. Right. Um, and we, like many other people, are endeavoring to figure out a pathway forward. What's the proper framework for getting these equities mm -hmm. correct? Can uh, I just jump in yeah, as sure. well? Because I mean, we we uh, we share some members and and others not. We tend to be more. Can you enterprise. highlight the violent disagreements between <laughs> yeah, exactly. the three of you? <laughs> um, <laughs> so we tend to be more enterprise facing. But I, you know, I think the the and I didn't hear Senator Warner's remarks. But I think you know, if, if I think the premise that our companies and I mean our companies are not being thoughtful about kind of social constructs and social benefits, at least in my experience, is, is not true. And it's not just about privacy. I think our companies are being very thoughtful about social impacts that are related to artificial intelligence. I think they are spending a lot of time thinking about workforce development. I think they are. Um, so I think there's there are a number of, of not just economic, but the social impacts that are being driven by changes in technology. And again, at least in my experience, but I would suspect in all of our experiences, the companies are, are being very thoughtful um, so about So BSA, your group, and, and Internet Association, both, uh, I think yesterday, at least with BSA, um, issued uh, up frameworks for what they see as the privacy discussion. Do you want to give us a you know quick at-bat uh, picture of what you're putting on the table that's 
that's um, and give us the most provocative part. <laughs> so I'll do a summary. I don't know how you, you can judge how provocative it is. So we put out 10 principles. Um, you know, we support federal legislation and we want to try to move that conversation forward. Um, but I would I would boil them down to sort of three core elements. One is in terms of the consumers, we want to give them independence and control. So there are a lot of aspects of our framework that would do that. In terms of companies, we want to make sure that there are strong obligations in terms of how they handle data, mm -hmm. in terms of making sure that they're giving consumers the information that they need in terms right. of how they handle it, and then they are actually following up by using it in a way that is consistent with that and that they are safeguarding the very important data that they have. Um, and then we are strong believers in strong enforcement. But having kind of having consumers have independence and control, having the companies have strong and meaningful obligations that really respect and honor right. consumer choices and having strong enforcement of that system, I think are the, the elements that are then kind of woven right. throughout the 10 principles Michael, we set out. We agree. <laughs> uh, I mean, we, we have actually, there's a lot of um, overlap between the two, which is, is encouraging. Um, this needs to be economy wide. I, again, you know, our collective companies and tech companies generally get the most attention as it relates to privacy, and that's fine. And um, I would argue that our companies are on the cutting edge in the way they're thinking about this and being responsible and transparent and providing new tools that always needs to evolve, that needs to um, uh, continue, but it does need to be economy wide because there are a lot of we're in the digital age. Every company now is using data in some way, and people have the right to know how their information is being used, have transparency and tools. A lot of that exists online, but it should exist um, economy-wide, but also we need to do it right. When you look at the growth that we've had here in the United States and the leadership we've had, particularly in the internet and technology sector, that's something we want to continue and allow for new business models to come about. Um, so it needs to be done in a way that... Um, continues to have innovation, you know, as we're protecting people and giving people choice and transparency and allows for all different business models to thrive. Even, you know, the, the business models that we know today and that exist and they're all, you know, different, but also business models maybe that we don't think about today that might come about in the future. And we, again, want to be leaders in that that are creating jobs and value. Um, and so we do have a lot of overlap. And, and if you look at our, our principles, they are very in depth with the intent of having actual legislation go and we're going to work um, really hard over the next you know, few months and certainly into next year after the election to get this done. Um, I so, think, but yeah, I, I think I, one of the, sorry. The, no, I was just going to say, I, just, I, think, I think it's really important. I think there are, they're, they are very consistent. There may be some sort of, to the extent they're different, it's all kind of degrees of emphasis. So, and I think that is really important because we do have some members that overlap, but you are the internet companies, you know, we are more enterprise facing. And I think the fact that we kind of independently came to a place that is right. as consistent as it is, is a really, is really important and really hopeful in terms of our joint ability to move this conversation Dean. forward. Yeah. I, I was just going to say that it, it is great to see that there is an alignment around the objective, um, which is to create interoperable systems and frameworks that avoid fragmentation. Uh, I think it's also great that we have in the marketplace endeavors to do that, that we can build upon and improve upon. Mm. And so GDPR gives us something that is no longer just a theory. It's a theory that can be tested sure. in the marketplace and to figure out, can we actually achieve the equities that are in the principles that are being advanced there, but in a way that allows companies, both big and small, to be successful. You know, as I've been listening to this conversation, just with the different stakeholders in it today, I'm asking you, you this, Dean, it's a, very high concept question is, I, I've been wondering if we're somehow deluding ourselves that that the rules we set, the norms we set, even in reaction to the GDPR or a California congressman, is somehow missing the picture. That when you look at where the future of the global middle class is, the United States is not going to contribute a whole bunch of that. It's going to be in Asia, South Asia. And so the question of other norms and practices, and this brings us really into China. And I know you've been there recently. You've thought a lot about China. And, and I, I'm just wondering, you know, when, when China can get Google to agree to censored searches or China is not having... I think this, there's a presumption there. Well, well we, I would love to hear your view on that. But when, when you look at the fact that they're probably not having this conversation in Shanghai uh, or Beijing like we, we are, it makes me wonder when you kind of look down the road, does this kind of concern become an inhibitor to growth, an inhibitor to success in a way that begins to create benefits for Chinese competition in sort of a different... I, I know it's a high concept question, but I think we, we're in the international space, and I think these norms internationally are going to be determined by 
the growth in markets. And that's not, in my view, going to be the United States. So how do you see it? Tell well, me where I, I'm wrong. I, well, I, I, it was simply the point, suggestion that we know Google's plans and I don't. So uh -huh. the- But you're closer to knowing them than I do. So what do you suspect? Maybe. I have no suspicion on that. Issue. I'm sure they'll tell you what they this think. This is off right? the record. It's all off yeah. the record. <laughs> I'm just among friends. Um, I, I think given what you described on what's happening all around the world, that it becomes particularly important to have systems that are interoperable. Uh, and second, I think as a result, companies that operate globally become particularly important mm. in informing this conversation because those companies are actually seeing what's happening everywhere and can try to make sense of it and contribute to this conversation. Interestingly enough, I was in China last week and they are thinking about privacy, but you're right, Steve, the way that they think about it has nuances that's very different than the way we do. They are thinking about privacy, but inter interrelated to their considerations of privacy are issues around national security. And so it's, is anything it's almost, not national security. In no, China? not at all. In fact, <laughs> when you take off on ear China, they immediately announce that the cabin is being recorded. Mm -hmm. And so the considerations are different there. I think Victoria's point about the, the fact that there is really interesting work happening in Asia generally and in other parts of the world, and how can we endeavor, because these issues are so interrelated and so global, when you travel around the world, you want the rules to be largely consistent. You don't want to get off a plane in China or get off a plane in Brazil and not have your, your phone work. In the same way, you want to have your privacy protected as you move around the world. And so that's one of the, the things that we are working hard at. Uh, in this conversation, both in the United States and in the rest of Victoria, the world. Victoria, do you want to come in? Well, I just, so it's, it sounded to me potentially like one of the underlying premises of your question is that strong privacy protection could be a competitive disadvantage. And so I just want to be clear that we I, don't think that's true. I mean, our companies are doing I, it. I'm just raising the question. Right. I don't know the answer to it. Right. It's just, so um, I, I have to tell you, going to Asia a lot and, you know, industry after industry after industry, the sort of, you know, some of the normative questions we struggle with um, they don't. And you can look at genetics, okay. you can look so, at a lot of other areas. And I think that the Chinese or the my friends in Korea often look at that, the, the absence of those constraints as opportunity for them in contrast. So I'm just giving you a I, I, Exactly. So, but I'm, my only point is I, I don't buy into that. And, and I think strong privacy, you can be very competitive in strong privacy protections. I mean, I think our, our companies do it because they're trying to respond to what right. their customers and consumers want but I don't think that's a drag on competition. I think there are other um, policy approaches that China, among other countries, could adopt that I would not consider to be privacy protective. I think they are much more about trying to keep data inside the borders of those countries. And I think those have real competitive uh, right. consequences on things like cloud computing, on the development of artificial intelligence. So you know, those, I think, would be a real concern. But high standards for privacy right. around the world and just, think just before you go to the audience, Michael, I want to ask you a question. You know, I, I, when you read, you know, uh, I, I'm into kind of sleuths and crime solving and spies and all that stuff uh, for fun. recommendations. And, and, uh, and, and, and there's not a day that goes by where a crime isn't solved by monitoring someone's Fitbit or being able to see where, the, where their car was. I mean, I, and I know that I mean, but it, 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 it sort of begins to swim close to the person that, that jaywalks in China and through facial recognition has, you know, a demerit against their, you know, uh, social score or something. And so I'm just interested in whether or not this debate, at least from a policing perspective or a knowledge of every digital moment we spend in our lives, has progressed so much that we actually can't go back to something meaningful. So why don't I yeah. give that to you and then we'll go to the audience. Well, we definitely should get rid of the, the speed camera tickets. That is just so unfair. It's, like not, it's not sporting at all. It's terrible. Yeah. Um, no, this is, this is, a, this is a, a core question um, and it relates a little bit, I guess, to your last question too. You know, we have a rule of law here and that's something that our companies take very, very seriously. And you know, part of this conversation is not just privacy from companies, it's privacy from the government and maintaining you know, strong rule of law where you, know, you have warrants and, and due process on these things where you know, the government just can't have blind surveillance on every single person. I mean, and you that... used to do battle with the NSA, right? And say so you can't have everything. 
<laughs> Look, we, we care about national security, obviously, but there's a big difference between the, the, I mean, our constitutional rights of the Fourth Amendment and our expectations as Americans versus China or versus Europe. Mm -hmm. And that's something that um, our companies are working on every day and that needs to be maintained and that needs to be part of the conversation because the difference between, you know, any one of our companies and the government is our companies aren't going to come and arrest you um, based on, on, um, on what you thought or said or did. I think I think one thing which Victoria alluded to is important to just pull out here, which is that increasingly we our companies are are competing with each other based on privacy, mm. um, and and providing features that give consumers a greater level of control and viewing that as a, a basis on which they can offer something that's different and distinct, uh, which I think is a great thing. And so this conversation is shifting legal norms around the world but it's also shifting social and engineering norms, mm. which I think ultimately redounds to the benefit of everyone. Fascinating. Let's go to the audience. Questions, comments. We've got one right here in the front and uh, we have one over there too. Okay. Yes. And we're going to ask short questions, short answers. Go ahead. Hank Wallace of hey. Write and Speak Like the News. Will artificial intelligence create a new avoidance of legal liability? Will companies be able to say, we didn't consciously decide to violate privacy. Our AI acts on its own. Interesting question. Accountability in AI. Um, so I think certainly not from our perspective, right? One of, one of the things that we think is core in terms of our privacy framework is making sure that there are those strong obligations on the companies that are enforceable. And then separately in terms of, or I guess relatedly, in terms of artificial, artificial intelligence and accountability, I mean, that is, you know, that is something, that is one of the issues that we are really spending a lot of time thinking about. Um, you know, decision-making and liability rules have been out there for a long time. So it's not like that is an area where there's no precedent going forward. But I think, you know, in terms of decision making and for our companies mostly what they use ai for is to let people make better decisions themselves rather than the ai you know i think we'll we'll i think we'll all be having conversations about that yeah, but to your specific question about privacy i think the answer is no i don't think that ai is going to give companies an ability Dean? to avoid important privacy obligations yeah i think whether it does or not will be determined by us because human beings have to set the rules such that these systems are human centered the machines won't set the rule. And so we still have time to, to shape it in a way that s serves our purposes. Yes. Uh, Clark Jennings with Kroll and Mooring here. A quick international question. You've talked about multiple times um, the ultimate goal of global harmonization and consensus, with, mm. which industry would, of course, appreciate. I think the concern is that from the EU's approach, they would prefer to export that global consensus in the form of GDPR. So piggybacking off of Steve, Victoria, other uh, points that you raised, how do we ensure that the Asia Pacific, you mentioned APEC, of course, there's cross-border privacy rules there. How do we ensure that these growth markets and kind of the global south right. writ large has a voice in this debate? What's industry's role? What's the U.S. Terrific role? question. I mean, so, I mean, we are kind of in the field talking to the governments of India, Japan, South Korea, Malaysia, Thailand, um, that are all actively in the process of uh, either of, of implementing new privacy laws or actively changing their privacy laws. So I think um, I think they are going to be part of the discussion. I think that's absolutely true. And as I actually think that the step of Japan getting the adequacy decision from the European Union mm -hmm. is really helpful in terms of making it very clear to the world at large that you don't have to have a cut and paste of the GDPR in order to be consistent with the GDPR, that you can have a system mm -hmm. the way Japan has a system, which is a very strong uh, level of privacy protection, but also has more flexibility and is consistent and compatible with the GDPR. Yeah, so, may, I, may I simply add sure. that there are good and compelling reasons not to cut and paste the GDPR. And so the, the foundational principles of the GDPR are good ones, but then on top of that are processes that I think will ultimately encumber businesses' ability to, to operate in Europe. And I, I think, and I think we'll actually end up harming Europe in the same way that 10 years ago, the leaders in mobility were based in Europe and today they're not because of many of the regulations that were put in place there. And so I think there are compelling reasons not to have GDPR be the final word in spite of the fact that well, companies are working Well, let me ask you, just to Paul, I'm going to go to this, this person in the back in a moment, but just you know, building off this excellent question, is there any chance at all as we think about a privacy framework or a privacy law, 
you know, in the next Congress, which has been discussed a lot this morning, that what the United States does, and, and, and take your industry hats off and, and give me your most cynical self, um, do, do you think that what the U.S. does could ever be actually a global benchmark and we actually become yeah. the extraterritorial norm setter? I think uh, absolutely. Uh, I was... Sorry, I think, ahead, well, sorry. I think it depends what you mean by benchmark. Because I actually, you know, we, I think it makes sense for, com for countries to have different systems based on what their public, what their consumers, what the individuals in right. that country, what their expectations are. And so I think those, I mean, I think the, the standards should be high, but I think it actually, there's some logic to the fact that it will be different country to country. So I think it depends what right. you mean by benchmark. I, I think the U.S., is and will continue to be an example to the rest of the world. So I think what we do here yeah. mm -hmm. in the U.S. Congress is really significant because I think countries will look to it as among the examples that they have before them as they're considering. So he, I think, but I think a scale of ten, he says a ten. You well, say well, a I, seven. Well, I, I, think, I, I agree. I mean, I agree with Victoria, but I think another way. Um, you're a seven also. I don't. Out of out of at a hundred. I think we're all tens. I mean, yeah. look, look at look, this panel. I mean, let, let's 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 on the U.S. becoming the benchmark. Yeah, we we we, sh we should be leaders, just like we've been leaders. We should in, be, but will and we, we will be leaders. We're going to be successful um, here. Can, can I just Failure is not an option. But also, yeah. the other thing, important thing to realize is most of the internet users around the world are outside of the United States. Right. But the leading companies and the jobs and economic growth, the core of that's here in the United States. And so we want to be able to allow these companies to keep exporting as, as global leaders. Right. And part of it is this. Yeah, I think, I think Victoria is right that each nation is approaching this as a sovereign. I think what I'm experiencing in the, as I travel around the world, though, is that because Europe has this adequacy process, they are influencing the world in a way that the U.S. has not. You no, know, they give the gold star. They're not exactly gold star, right. Yeah, and so. so you find country after country trying to solve for these issues right. and picking up a model that exists, and then the, they can't pick up the U.S. model because, in their mind, it doesn't exist. Yeah. And yeah. so I think fundamentally, the answer to your question is: in order to even have that influence, we have to get in the game, and and that's why we're going through the work that we've done. That's right. why these principles were released. That's why we're working on a framework so we can have a seat at the table and have something that a model that countries can look to. I'm but I think our this... model will be influential. Yeah, it's out there. But I'm going to take this last uh, question, and so make it really good. <laughs> no uh, pressure. Yeah. Hi, uh, Brennan Bordelon with National Journal. Um, could you guys address the extent to which uh, state efforts on privacy, I think particularly in California, but also in Illinois and elsewhere, how much that's driving your organization's support for a federal framework, a f eventual federal bill on uh, privacy legislation? Yeah, I, mean, I think this is an area, I mean, just I mean, like your international expectations, you know, that we can't have a patchwork of 50 different state rules, you know, as you're driving or, or, or flying from state to state, or you're, you know, FaceTime with your grandmother in Florida or something like you can't shouldn't have different rules across states. And um, a lot of this, too, is the perception to, to Dean and Victoria's point, you know, Europeans have something with a name GDPR, and it seems like this big thing. And so we also need something that people can look to and say, well, that's the American model. And that's something that works. But you can't have 50 different states. And in California in particular, I know we're, we're low on time. We think they got it wrong. And there's corrections that can be made at the federal level. Victoria? Um, I guess I would say, I think our company has been focused on privacy for a long time. So, you know, long before GDPR was making headlines or California, you know, I think, I think globally as much harmonization as we can, again, you know, being respectful of the fact that people in different countries will have different expectations. And so we want to respect those, but I think, you know, global harmony is where we would eventually like to get to. Yeah. And Garfield, last word. Our motivation is not reactionary. I think one of the things that has to be talked about is whether there is preemption in federal legislation, and we would support that. There has to be. Well, with that, Dean Garfield, Victoria Espinel, Michael Beckerman, thank you all very, very much. Thank you.